In Luke chapter 2, we have one of the pivotal moments of human history. Those, all the years count down to the birth of Christ, and since then we're counting from the birth of Christ. But the life of Christ that we're studying is a series of those pivotal events that change the course of human history. Adam set us on a course to sin and bondage and an eternity in hell because of that sin. And the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning with his incarnation, which is what we're going to look at this morning, the birth of Jesus. And then his sinless life and his atoning death on Calvary, the shedding of his blood for our sins, his burial, his resurrection. All of those are pivotal moments culminating in the resurrection from the dead because the fact that he arose again gives us hope that we too will live. Had he not come out of that grave, had he not been virgin born, had he not come, had he not lived a sinless life, had he not died on that cross, any of these events taken out of God's plan would have canceled our salvation. It would have rendered us hopeless. But when you look at the intricacy of God's plan and design and the sovereignty, as we're going to see this morning, even in the manipulating of ungodly, perverse, wicked men and devoted servants of the Lord, he brings all of it together to bring about his plan, whether by the disobedience of men or by the obedience of men, in the end, he receives the glory and the honor. And if that doesn't make you respect and honor and fear this type of God who can sovereignly do this while granting man that free will to obey or disobey, then you don't have a full understanding of who God is. Because that is, humanly speaking, we say it's impossible. Well, there, here in the introduction to Luke chapter 2, I, I put on the handout the Nativity roller coaster. As I was reading this account of Luke 2, 1 through 20, it, was, it reminded me of, I think it was Apollo's chariot. Was it Apollo's chariot? One of those roller coasters that it, it starts off low and then it just slowly climbs that huge long mountain. You can almost see your house from there by the time you get to the top. And then it just releases. You go through a series of ups and downs, ups and downs. And then it just all of a sudden throws you into a curve and brings you all the way back going up and down, highs and lows. And, of course, everybody's screaming and feeling like they're going to be thrown out of the thing. Well, this, this passage, there are ten of these such hills that begins with the low and goes to a high and the low. And let me, let me just kind of walk you through it. It begins with the low of Caesar Augustus. A perverse, wicked king who would be God. He desired to be a God. And then it goes to the high of God superintending over the historical events that led to the, bring, the coming of the Messiah. And then back to a low when God became man. Here God leaves glory to come down to poverty. And he was born in a very lowly, humble, simple way. To become as creator and sustainer of the universe, he became a part of that creation, took upon him the form of man. He humbled himself. And that takes us to the next high, which is the gospel. The, the news that the angels came to announce to the shepherds. He says, we have good news. That's the gospel. That's what gospel means. And then it takes us to, as the shepherds are the first recipients of that message, that's another low. They were considered the lowest on the social status in terms of people. They were considered dishonest. They were considered unclean to be a shepherd. But then we see the high, at least for those shepherds. They were the first to hear, but they were the first to go worship the Lord Jesus. Why did Jesus come? He came to seek and to save that which was lost, Luke 19, verse 10. The theme of the Gospel of Luke. And who, to whom did he come? But to the, He didn't come to the king. He didn't go to Caesar. He didn't go to Cyrenius. He didn't go to Herod the Great. He didn't go to the temple, to the priests, chief priests and high priests and all those. He went out into the dark fields of Bethlehem. And he appeared to those shepherds that night. What a high for them to be the first ones to go worship. And then the low, the babe in the manger. You say, well, I thought the, the babe in the manger would be a high. No, when you stop and think of the manger, the stall, and the picture that that is, it's a, it's a symbol of the deadly purpose for which he came. 
Another song Brother Earl has sung for us by Ron Hamilton is Born to Die. That title is kind of, it sounds kind of morbid, doesn't it? Born, no, we were born to live, not born to die, but Christ, he was born to die upon Calvary. So the, the picture of the babe in the manger, understanding the purpose for which he lay there and for which he came, and the very location where he was was a total picture that God had begun painting back in the Garden of Eden and all through the Old Testament sacrifices. The next high is the greatest message mankind ever heard. That's what that sacrifice was going to represent. The fact that he did come to seek and to save that which was lost and he gave himself on Calvary to provide the means by which we could be reconciled with God. But then we have another low and Mary and all of this excitement and the angels coming and the shepherds and all the excitement that was, she kept those things in her heart and pondered them. She could have become proud and puffed up and begun to brag and no. Joseph, we never see a word, we never hear a word recorded in scripture from Joseph. They were lowly, humble. This is a good, some of these are good lows. And then it ends on a high mark, the results of all this, God gets the praise and glory. So as we go through verses 2 through 20, we're going to learn we can trust God through the highs and the lows of life, whatever they are. Read with me in verse, chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that the, all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her, her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Let's pray. Father, as we come to celebrate again the birth of Christ, though it's not our typical season for this, or this is something we can celebrate any time as we go to your word and understand again the depths of your love for us that brought about the redemption plan. And the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, who became man and lived a sinless life and went to Calvary for us. And then his death, burial, and resurrection give us that confidence that our sins are forgiven and that our hope of eternity in heaven is sure. Encourage our hearts again as we consider this this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, in this passage, we see here in verses 1 through 7 and also verse 10, 11, we see that we can trust God in the highs and lows of life because of fulfilled prophecies. You see, prophecy is when God tells us ahead of time what's going to happen. You and I can't do that. We can try to prophesy. Now, let me caution you about claiming to be a prophet in prophesying. The penalty for a false prophet and a false prophet is one who prophesies and it doesn't take place, or he prophesies in contradiction to other clear revelation from God, the penalty is death. And, and it does, it's not you get three strikes and you're out. No, the first strike, you're stoned to death. So before you aspire to becoming a prophet and practicing this, be very cautious. But there are hundreds of prophecies. God raised up prophets and he spoke through them to his people. And for hundreds of years, this event would take place. But I want you to understand there are some details of these prophecies that they are so specific to be given centuries before the event took place. How in the world do you bring all these things about? For example, the Messiah would be of the tribe of, uh, of the uh, son of Abraham, of the tribe of Judah of the house and lineage of King David. And then he would be born in Bethlehem. All this had to come together. And I want you to look with me at the 
sovereign orchestration of all these humans, human events, historical events, to bring these things about to fulfill to the last detail the prophecies that were given about this. Beginning with Caesar Augustus. Now, he was born Gaius Octavius. The Roman Senate in 27 BC bestowed on him the term, the title Augustus. This was a title that up until this point had been reserved only for gods. And they decided to put it on him because he was the ruler of the entire Roman world. He ruled from 27, well, before 27 BC, I guess, to 14 AD. Historians say he's the great nephew of Julius Caesar. He was a born fighter. And he clawed his way to the top. He, he defeated Antony and Cleopatra. And then with considerable genius, he forced, and the force of his person, he gave the empire the solidness to endure for centuries. It's, it's fascinating to go and read the history behind this man. But he was the first Caesar to be called Augustus. A term, again, it means holy, revered. In fact, this same Title, at this same time Luke was writing these words, some of the Greek cities in Asia Minor, they had adopted his birthday, September 23rd, as the first day of the year. So they started revolving their clock around Caesar Augustus. In one of the places, they had an inscription on uh, the birthplace of the famous Herodotus. They said they called Caesar Augustus the savior of the world. So we see this is a perverse man. He had basically brought about the Roman Empire and stabilized it literally for centuries throughout that area by the force of his leadership. And, and he accepted this title, and he would be a god, and others would have him to be. In fact, John Buchan says that when Caesar Augustus died, men actually comforted themselves with this. Well, Augustus is a, king, is a god, and gods don't die, so he's okay. So they comforted themselves this way. So the world had at its helm at this time when it says in the, it came to pass that, that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. The Caesar, the emperor of the Roman world, which was the, mainly the civilized world of the day. A self-proclaimed widely accepted God and Savior is the way they presented him. And that couldn't have been more false it couldn't be more misguided but how is God going to use such a perverse man to bring about the fulfillment of the prophecies well he the Bible says here there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed this is the Roman world some interpret it to be all the inhabited world which they they claim he had conquered I'm not sure which it is but at least all of the Roman world under which Israel while it was dispersed Judah, the two tri southern tribes, they were in the land, and they would fall under this taxation. It's not a, the census that was to be taken was for taxing purposes, not military purposes. But we see that this taxing was first done uh, when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. This would have been the government that would oversee this, the southern part of Israel. So they would be under his leadership. And then, of course, Herod the Great, the king, the king of the Jews, as he, he was recognized, he would have to enact, as much as he disliked to be serving under these other leaders, he would have to enact all this. But in order for this to take place, now we have to look at <coughs> not only these wicked kings, but you have these godly people. Joseph and Mary, we have studied in Luke chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 1, how that God's choosing them and using them for the birth of the Messiah was a life-altering event for them. But here they are, the saviors to be born in Bethlehem. So it's very specific. And they live 85 miles to the north in Galilee, in Nazareth. While they are both of the lineage of David, Joseph, he is a carpenter in Nazareth. He lives there. Mary's home is there. And of course now we've seen the events that have brought them together even though they have not yet consummated their marriage. We see that they now have to go. Verse 3 says, And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. They being of the house and lineage of David, they would have to go back to that hometown of Bethlehem, which was the birthplace of King David. 
So you see how God is now? But how do you get them down there? Well, he uses the emperor to tell the governor to tell King Herod to do this taxation, which brings them down from Nazareth in the middle of the winter. They will have to go through some very, very rugged terrain. As I said, it's 80 to 85 miles. Nazareth, depending on which part of Nazareth you're in, it can be anywhere from 1,040 feet above sea level to 1,586 feet above sea level. And then they have to descend all the way below sea level, 1,400 feet, to the Sea of Galilee as they go down and go up by the Jericho Road to ascend 4,000 feet back up into Jerusalem. And these are rugged terrain. She's eight, almost nine months pregnant. 85 miles in the winter, a five to six day journey. And while we see all these pictures with her sitting on a donkey, it doesn't say that in Scripture. There's no reason to believe she did not walk most of this way. Perhaps someone lent that to them, but they would have been poor. And we don't know that they would have had that. But they make that trip and bring them to this place and how God uses these events to bring them where he needs them to be, to fulfill that prophecy given in Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So this child to be born, while humanly speaking, there is a beginning of his human incarnation. He is from everlasting. He is eternal. So we understand that it, it, Micah has to be speaking of the Messiah here and where he would be born. And of course, God superintends to bring them down to Bethlehem, to the royal city of David. Can we trust a God who can superintend events in this way to bring the details? We talked last time about how had Joseph been the physical father and he'd been of the seed of Joseph, how he would have been disqualified to sit on the throne of David because of Jeconiah and his curse back in Jeremiah 22, 30. And how that legally, yes, he, he has a legal title to the throne through his adoptive father Joseph, but his royal claim to the throne is through Mary and her lineage from a different branch of David's family through Nathan. How God, in every minute detail, brings about what had been prophesied beginning back in Genesis chapter 3. You can trust God because of fulfilled prophecies. Other prophecies are going to be fulfilled there in verses 10 and 11. Uh, we'll get to those in a moment, but it's the angel said, Fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, where God said it would, the Savior that he promised, and I'm going to give you his name, he's Christ the Lord, or his title. His name is Jesus. His title is Christ the Lord. God fulfilled all of those promises that he had been given to Abraham and to mankind for centuries. But not only can we believe and trust God in the highs and lows of life because of fulfilled prophecy, but there are fulfilled types. A type in scripture is a figure, a symbol, a picture that foreshadows its anti-type, which is yet to come. In the Old Testament, we find many types that are fulfilled in the New Testament through their antitype. Manna is a type of the Word of God. We also see that uh, there are other types we mentioned on the, I'm trying to find my outline here that I gave you. I put some there that I don't have on my notes. Egypt is a type of the world, a picture and figure. That's why many times that symbol of Egypt is a picture of the world and bondage, and it will be referred to even in the New Testament that way. Leaven is a picture and type of sin. The sacrificial lambs, which is the type that we're going to look at that's fulfilled here, is a type of Christ, God's perfect lamb. And here in, this, in the coming of Christ, I believe we see one of the greatest types of all the scriptures fulfilled in even greater detail than modern traditions hold. But the Jewish traditions are very suggestive and seem to be more in conformity with the passages of scriptures as to the very location where Jesus was born. Well, he was born in Bethlehem, yes, but where in Bethlehem? Well, there's no room for him, for him in the end. Notice what it says there in verse 7. It says, she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, 
and laid him in a manger because there's no room for them in the inn. Now, many traditions hold that, okay, they sent him around back of the inn and put him in the old dirty stable back there with the donkeys and horses and cattle and those things. But Jewish tradition does not hold that. The church of the nativity there in Bethlehem, while that may be some of the religious traditions that that's where he was born, that's not what the early Jewish traditions were. Alfred Edersheim, he brings out a lot about this. And he believes that this, and I, I believe it based on some things we see in this passage too, and I'll point those out in a moment, that he was not born there in the downtown part of Bethlehem, but he was born in the outskirts at the Tower of the Flock. Let me tell you about the Tower of the Flock, and that's what's on the back of that card. The Tower of the Flock was a, pl a special place. It had been a military tower to watch there five miles from Jerusalem. They were watching for the enemy, but it became used of shepherds. And while this was, again, five and a half miles from Jerusalem and the temple where the, these travelers would come, from time to time to offer sacrifices. Well, if they came from a distance, they would not bring a lamb from there. They would many times purchase one on the way into Jerusalem and then take it to the temple and offer their sacrifice. These shepherds to whom the angels appeared here in verse 8, these were not just any ordinary shepherds because the tower of the flock, according to Jewish tradition, is these were the, the sheep that were to be offered in the temple sacrifices. That means it's not every sheep. The sheep are out in the fields, and the shepherds, when a sheep is about to birth a lamb, they would carry that sheep into the tower of the flock, under which there was a cave. That's why you often hear that Jesus was not born in a stable, he was born in a cave. Well, there is a cave, a cutout, underneath the tower of the flock. And that's where the lambs would be birthed. And then, upon birth, the shepherds would examine that lamb very carefully. If there's any spot or blemish that would disqualify it from God's standard for temple sacrifices, the lamb would then be moved to other shepherds and other flocks somewhere else. They would not remain among these flocks that were dedicated only to temple sacrifices. If it was found to be without spot and blemish, perfect lamb, they would then wrap it in swaddling cloths and carry it up into the tower, into a manger stall, and they would lay it there until it was ready to go out into the fields with the other lambs. So as we, with that in mind, and that type of the lambs that were slain from the beginning of time when man sinned and the sacrifices were offered and the blood was shed as an atonement, those lambs were not the ones who took away the sins of the people. They covered the sins of the people. Until that perfect Lamb of God, as John the Baptist will say in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Do you see the type? The type in the Old Testament are the lambs. The antitype is the Lord Jesus Christ. They would cover the sins until the coming of the one Lamb of God, who once and for all, past, present, and future, would be God's satisfaction, God's propitiation for our sins. So look at verse 8, with that in mind. Where in Bethlehem would this birth have taken place? And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. That's been the reaction of each one to whom the angels have appeared. And lo, the angel of the Lord, uh, verse 10, and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you the gospel. Good tidings of great joy. Good news is the word gospel. When we preach the gospel, we're preaching the good news of the death, burial, resurrection, and soon return of Jesus Christ. They came to tell him, the Savior who's going to die and be buried and rise again and save the world from their sins, he's born unto you this day. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you... The lowly shepherds, these rejects, in fact, some of them, many times they were not permitted to, do work, to be a part of worship because their job rendered them unclean, ceremonially unclean pretty much all the time. And the, t the days of purification would not pass. So they were kind of a different group. They were, not, while necessary to provide the sacrifices for all of Israel, they were kind of rejects in terms of society. But interestingly, 
Isn't it fascinating that that's the ones to whom Jesus came? Why, Luke 19.10, why did Jesus come? Why did he become man? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't go to those that thought they needed no Savior. He went to those that knew they needed a Savior. And that's why I think it's very fitting that in the type and picture, he appeared first to the shepherds. But look at the message to them. He tells them, who was born in the city of David? Okay, let's, let's go down the prophecy checklist. Unto you is born, God promised he would send a, a, a Savior. In the city of David, the town of Bethlehem, that's where he said it would happen. Now, you're shepherds here in the fields around Bethlehem. And he said he would send a Savior for Israel and the world. And he said, it's Christ the Lord, it's the Messiah. He's born tonight. Can you imagine all that, the anticipation of all those centuries of prophecies? And all of a sudden, these shepherds sitting out there and they get this message. I imagine their hair probably stood on end. They, they, they just got those chills and they said, can it be happening? Can these angels, and of course you can't deny the angel there in the dark and he appears before them. And, well, then he goes on to say, for unto you, verse 12, this shall be a sign unto you. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Now that phrase right there is vital. Notice that in the birth of Jesus, in the, in the birth of John the Baptist, it's basically two verses that cover it, and it's very vague, and no, no details. Here, Luke, a medical doctor, that's a fascinating birth. Here's a woman who is deemed to be past childbirth age, but yet he does not spend time describing that birth. Here he gives us very vital details as he records the birth of Christ, and one of those is this will be the sign. This is how you're going to recognize the Messiah that's born to you. You're going to find a babe. Wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Now, you remember the wise men? We're going to see them in Matthew chapter 2 in a few weeks. Well, when the wise men came, they saw the star. They followed the star all the way down to Jerusalem. And they went to the king and said, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we've come to worship him. Now, they had a star to guide them. They were wise men. They had known the prophets, prophecies going back to Daniel. And they were coming to worship, but they didn't know where to go. So they were inquiring, asking, how do we find this king of the Jews? Now, this was, we believe, months later, maybe years later. But the shepherds didn't say, okay, where is he? Well, he's lying at, well, which manger, which stall, which stable? No questions were asked. This will be a sign. You'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But for these shepherds, they needed no more information. Notice what they said. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary, Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. No searching, no inquiring, no asking. Because when they said to these elite shepherds, guarding, guarding over those flocks destined for temple sacrifices, their headquarters was the tower of the flock. They knew the practice, and when this Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the perfect Lamb of God, was born, the Jewish tradition holds that it was there in the tower of the flock. They believe the prophecy of Micah 4 8 is referring to that same place and that event, even though it's speaking of the kingdom, but it's also a prophecy of that same location. And there that babe was born. And taken up and wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in the manger, just like the lambs that were destined to be sacrificed. The ultimate fulfillment of that great type of the Old Testament in the lambs is fulfilled in the very birth of Christ as he is laid in that manger stall. Destined for Calvary to be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. No more appropriate fulfillment than that. Well, the types are fulfilled. Whether he was born there or not, the type is still fulfilled. But as I've studied it, I find that it is fascinating. The scriptures seem to indicate, and these shepherds and the statement made and the, no need for further explanation, they knew exactly where to go. 
Well, we can trust God through the highs and lows of life also because of the message fulfilled. Verses 13 to 15. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. The message of salvation. God has sent you a Savior and he has given you the means by which you can be at peace with God. The shepherds were the first to hear the message. The shepherds were the first to believe it. The first to act upon the message. The first to worship the Savior incarnate. The first to testify of the message. And the first to glorify and praise God as a result of the message. And yet they were the rejects of society. How God came to those who needed a Savior. But we can also trust him because of the mission that was fulfilled in the incarnation. Look at verse 16. And they came with haste and they found Mary and Joseph. And they found the babe lying in a manger. They said, let's go and find out. We, we believe the message the angels told us. It'd be hard not to believe it, wouldn't it? The spectacular thing that they had witnessed. Not only the one angel, and then all of a sudden there's a, a multitude of angels, of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying. So they said, let's go. And they went and they found exactly what had been promised. God had fulfilled. You can trust God because he fulfilled. And the mission of saving the world began with the incarnation. Now, we seem to think that this began at that year, at that point in history, but the reality is the Bible tells us God had not only sent his son, but slain his son before the foundation of the world. But they heard that message, they believed that message, and the mission was fulfilled. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He left heaven, he took upon himself the form of man, he became, took... He became a human being, 100% God and 100% man. I still don't fully understand that. I know it's true. The scripture says it is. But that mission of the incarnation. Now, he would still be tempted. And he would still go through the ministry of revealing God to us in person. He's the living word. And then he would go to Calvary and become the sacrificial lamb. He would be buried. He would rise again victorious. All that still had to happen. But the incarnation was the beginning of those events. John 1.14. Look with me there if you will. John chapter 1. Verse 14. It's kind of the summary of. John's introduction. To the life of Christ. He starts telling us in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So this is the same God there in Genesis 1.1. The creator of the world. The sustainer of the world. He's also the end to which creator goes. Is made by him and for him. Colossians chapter 1 tells us. Now. Look at verse 14. And the word. Capital W. The word was made flesh and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten father, full of grace and truth. The mission of sending Christ to the world to become a man, to reveal the father to us and to accomplish our salvation. And then John in his statement, John 1 29, behold the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The one, the forerunner, the preparer of the way of the Messiah he summarizes his life and ministry as that. The fulfillment of that type we refer to. He's the Lamb of God. All those lambs that have been slaughtered, especially those in the more recent years as they were in the land that were raised there at the Tower of the Flock in Bethlehem near Jerusalem. Destined for sacrifices. But hey, this is the Lamb. Not a Lamb. It's the Lamb. Of God that takes away, not covers, takes away the sin of the world. The mission was fulfilled. And it's so aptly described in that song, Born to Die. The chorus is, Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sins to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. Well, finally, we can trust God in the highs and the lows of life. 
because of the ministry to be fulfilled. There is a ministry that's to be fulfilled. All of this was not made just so we can sit around and sing about it and enjoy and have a, another celebration for the year. There's a ministry to be fulfilled. Look in verse 17, if you will. Still referring to the shepherds. And when they had seen it, okay, they heard it, they believed it, they acted upon it and went, they worshiped, and when they had done all this, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Even though they were kind of the rejects of society, looked down and they probably kind of avoided and talked about them too and this, but no. This could not be withheld just to them. This could not be kept from anyone. They made and known all abroad what was made, told them concerning the child. And all they that heard it wondered. And this isn't wondered as in, I wonder if you're telling the truth. You know, we say, well, I wonder. That, that's not the word here. The, the wonder here is the word marveled. These shepherds, the angels appeared to them and told them this. They went and saw it. And everyone marveled at the testimony of the shepherds. Never sell yourself short. Say, well, I can't witness to somebody. They won't believe me. God can't use me to communicate his word to others. No, if you're saved by the grace of God, then you have all it takes to share his gospel with others. And that's the indwelling Holy Spirit. They told them, notice what they told them, what was told them concerning this child. Who did they tell? Whoever they met. Now Mary, it's interesting, she didn't get puffed up and all this. She pondered these things in her heart. She was careful. And the shepherds, they returned and this is the result, folks. When God's plan is carried out, the end result will be that he's going to receive the glory and the praise. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. Now look at this, as it was told unto them. See, this is all God asked for us in this ministry, in, in spite of all of what, not in spite, but in light of all that he did for us. Fulfilling the prophecy, fulfilling the type, fulfilling the message, fulfilling the mission. But notice this last one is not past tense. It's not fulfilled. It's a ministry to be fulfilled. We have a responsibility in light of what has been revealed to us. They had very little revelation at that point. Only what the angels told them and what they saw in that limited scene. We have the completed scriptures and the, uh, the vision of history. We know more about the whole picture than they did. And therefore, we have a greater responsibility to do as they did and to tell others. But you tell it how? As it was told to you. That which you have seen in the scriptures and learned, that which you have experienced by the transforming power of the blood of Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit, share that with others. Tell them what God has done for you. Because that is the whole purpose of the birth of Jesus Christ, to reveal the Father to us. Do you know him today? I believe everyone here is born again and knows the Lord. And if we do, we have a responsibility. How faithful are we to, number one, trust the Lord in light of all that he's done? How can we not trust him? How can we doubt his ability or his intention to do what he said he was going to do? But secondly, how can we, being the benefactors of such marvelous events, fail to tell others what God has done for us? That's the message this morning. It's not just looking back and celebrating again a great story. It's there's a mission that is yet, a ministry that is yet unfulfilled that we were left here to do. To testify of the gospel of the grace of God. In Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. In that uttermost parts of the earth, if you look real carefully, you'll see Christiansburg, Virginia. Elliston, Reiner, Floyd. We have a ministry to be fulfilled. How are we going about that ministry? Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for Christ. Lord, we thank you for his birth and all that that entails. We can look at his birth, we can look at his, sin, his sinless life, we can look at 
Calvary, we can look at the resurrection. All of them are part of that one historical event of redemption. And Lord, how we are blessed. We sinners who are bound for a Christless eternity are the benefactors and we are saved by your grace, extended to us through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as such, Lord, help us to fulfill that ministry you have laid for us to make that message known to the uttermost parts of the earth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.